Uh, there we go. Um, so I'm I'm a bit overwhelmed at how many of you there are, and I really want to thank you for for coming and. Joshua and uh, T T Tyson, who helped us with this, we had a very quick check-in by email um, the first week of shutdown saying, do you really think we should be doing this? And we all, we, I think we all wanted to ask the question, but we all had the same answer, which is, of course we should, because we need to do things that are not just business meetings. We need to do stuff that hopefully enriches our, our souls as well. So um, anyway. I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes and then we'll have some time for, for, other, for other stuff. Um, so most of us have participated uh, in the Kairos blanket exercise um, where we imagine indigenous people's experience of colonization. But how many of us, excuse me, I do have an itchy nose, I don't have COVID. How many of us have tried to understand our settler family's experience and how it continues to ripple through society. Okay, it's not working. There we go. What on earth could this little family have to do with colonization? This picture is of my grandmother, Flora, my mother, Sophie, me, the cutest one, it's right there in the middle my siblings, John, Elizabeth, and Brian. And this was taken in about 1968 or 1969. This is the story of one part of my family, and my family's story is one part of colonization. I've been exploring my family's experience as settler colonials for a few years. It started with the desire to mo know more about this place that I really loved a small corner of Northwestern Bonavista Bay in Newfoundland. I never lived there, but I spent many summers of my childhood there. I really, really love this place. And I wanted to know what is it that connects me to the land? What connects my family to the land? And what might've connected other people to that land? And what happened between us? This started in me a bit of a dive into family history. It's been part of a process of decolonizing, not just myself, but also my discipleship. And by that, I mean my stance of learning and of following Jesus' call to build right relations. So I come from a long line of Newfoundlanders, almost all from Bonavista North, particularly the small settlement of Safe Harbor, which was a whaling station until the 1920s and a fishing and sealing community until the 1950s. This painting of Safe Harbor was done by my great uncle Charles Hounsell from memory on the balcony of his Toronto apartment in the 1980s. It is the Safe Harbor of the 1930s as he remembers it. Some of my relatives take issue with the placement of certain houses, but there's nothing you can do about that. My parents were both born in Safe Harbor, and while they were the last generation of our family to have lived there, Safe Harbor has remained an important place for all of our extended family. In looking at my family history, I decided to trace the family of my maternal grandmother, Flora Hounsell Osmond. And I was only able to do this because of the help of my cousins, two generations of cousins, and my partner. So they deserve credit for this as well. Both of these photos are of someone named Flora, and you're gonna have to try and figure out which one I'm actually talking about today. Now, Flora's great-grandfather, Richard Hounsell, came to Bonavista North by way of Bridport, Dorset, in the late 1810s or 1820s. Bridport is around here. That's why there's a big dot there. Now, Dorset, beginning in the 16th century, was a vital part of the English West Country fishery. The waters off Newfoundland were well stocked with cod. You may have heard the famous account of John Cabot's crew in 1497 that, the sea there is full of fish that could be taken not only with nets, but with fishing baskets. Four major colonial powers, Por Portugal, Spain, England, and France, were active in the Newfoundland fishery, which was run by powerful and wealthy merchant families, and also supported by um, colonial navies. The English, which is the folks from Dorset, 
um, sailed seasonally to fish in the waters closest to the island. They brought the fish ashore to stages in what were called fishing rooms to salt and dry it. This is a picture of a stage in a fishing room. So this is, uh, it's like a big wharf and there's, these are called flakes, the fish is laid out on them. And all the work cleaning and um, saving the, the liver oil and all of that is done there. And it's basically on a piece of land that's called the fishing room. This is a French stage, not an English stage. Now, depending on the condition of the fish once it was dried, um, it was either sent to the West Indies as food for slaves in the sugar trade or back to England and Europe as food. The fishermen also went back to England at the end of the summer. Uh, the migratory fishery was a seasonal uh, adventure. Permanent settlement was actively discouraged. The idea was simply to take as much fish as you possibly could from the area and not invest in government and communities and having to build a colony. Both the English and the French experimented with settlements and some migratory fishermen overwintered, turning these fishing rooms into settlements. But permanent settlement was not actively encouraged until the 1760s after the um, Seven Years War and the American Revolution disrupted trade. Now, I decided to look back a bit further from Richard. And from Richard, I could go back four more generations uh, in, in, of councils in Dorset. They would all have been active either directly in the migratory fishery or in the industries like rope making, shipbuilding, um, woolens uh, that supported it. The West Country fishery was a huge venture, sending hundreds of ships each summer. Generations of men on my father's side, most of whom are also from Dorset, would have shared this history. So this, what, this path that you see here, which is for the councils, you would have seen from Stratus as well. At any rate, Richard Hansel was, was the first to come to Bonavista North. He settled in Pinchard's Island and married a woman called Grace, uh, Grace Perry. This is Pinchard's Island up here. So this is, this is Bonavista North and this is a close up map of it. Uh, Richard and Grace had a child named William who married Louisa Way of Fair Island. All of these are very close together. You'll see a number of places highlighted on the map and they'll come up in the talk because they are part of my family's history. So Richard and Grace, they had a child named Enoch who married Lucy Lush. Here is Enoch as a young man and Lucy obviously much later in life. Enoch and Lucy had six children in Safe Harbor, including Flora. And I'm just gonna go back to show you Safe Harbor. This is where Safe Harbor is. So they had six children in Safe Harbor, including Flora, my grandmother. Flora married William Osmond of Gooseberry Island, and they had six children also in Safe Harbor, including my mother, Sophie. This is a picture of uh, Flora and Wilfred with four of their children. This is Daisy, this is uh, Nita, this is Charles, and this is Pierce. Pierce uh, died shortly after this picture was taken or a couple of years after this picture was taken at the age of 15 from meningitis. My grandmother was pregnant with my mother at the time this picture was taken. And then two years later, the sixth child, Wilfred was born, but he died in infancy. So the next layer, is Sophie, this is Sophie, who married Jack Stratton of Safe Harbor, and they had four children, including me. Um, she left Safe Harbor at age 10 when her family left because my grandfather got a job at the mill, and my father left Safe Harbor at age 17 to join the Royal Air Force uh, for World War II, and this, this picture is a Royal Air Force event. Um, Wilfred got a job in the mill in Cornerbrook, yeah. So this picture was taken of them uh, with some friends in the 1960s. And as you can see, they had a very different life than my grandparents did. And so did my other aunts and uncles. Now I mentioned those four communities, Fair Island, Gooseberry Island, Safe Harbor, and Pinchardus Island. Um, by the time my family is active in those communities, um, they're no longer fishing rooms, but they're actual settlements. Um, but they served a very important purpose, and that was to provide workers for the cod fishery. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the nature of the cod fishery. 
By the 19th century, when Richard arrived and settled here, the cod fishery was permanent, but it was still run by merchant families. And in what was known as the truck systems system, merchants advanced fishing families the staple foods that they required, flour, salt, molasses, maybe some salt beef or salt pork, as well as the clothing and equipment that was uh, needed for fishing. So this was all advanced on credit. Then the man of the family, um, in our family's case, everyone from my great, great, great grandfather, Richard, to my grandfather, Wilfred, signed on with the merchant family's fishing ships. And uh, they were gone all summer catching and drying fish. At the end of the fishing season, they would settle up with the merchant, merchant trading the value of their share of the ship's catch against the debt that they and their families had incurred. Depending on the catch and the merchant's generosity, uh, you would walk away either more indebted or with only a small amount of cash. The system gave, Newfoundland, gave rise to one of Newfoundland's great folk songs, Hard Times, and you can read the first verse here. You. <clears throat> Most people don't know, I don't think, that for many years with the truck system, Newfoundland had a labor system that was as exploitative and controlling of poor workers as the white sharecropper system was in the United States. My grandparents did not fully emerge from this system until 1941, when my mother was still a child and my grandfather got that job in the mill in Cornerbrook. And it was a cruel system. It was personally cruel. Sometime before they left Safe Harbor, my grandmother went to the merchant to buy a China teacup for my mother. The shop woman asked, why does your child need a China cup? A tin can is good enough for your child. Flora walked out of the store and waited till she could get across to another community uh, to buy a cup and saucer. This slide is the last verse of Hard Times, and it captures just how tragic the truck system was and the excellent Newfoundland sense of humor that allowed us to cope with things like that. I don't want to give the impression that it was all just men who did the work. When they were away in the summer fishing or cutting lumber in the fall or hunting seals in the winter, it was, of course, the women who provided. They raised pigs and chickens for eggs and meat. They grew root vegetables in thin, rocky soil and stored them in root cellars. If you go to Bonavista Bay these days, you can actually visit some of these old root cellars. They spent days picking berries and putting them up as preserves. This is actually a picture of my grandmother Stratton uh, and her friends taking a tea break while picking berries. It was, though, a hard and dangerous life, and I was always amazed to see how my family survived and rose out of it through sheer hard work. But it turns out, of course, that sheer hard work wasn't quite the whole story. The Newfoundland fishery was the backbone of the British Empire. It fed sailors and soldiers in wars of the 18th and 19th centuries. It continued to feed slaves in the West Indies under sla until slavery was abolished there. And then it continued to feed black workers in a white controlled system. North Atlantic trade was a triangle, with the merchants of Newfoundland occupying a key role. They received salt and other supplies from England, and interestingly, port in need of aging from Portugal. In return, they sent back high quality salt fish and aged port. They also sent second quality, or what was called West Indy salt fish, to the British Caribbean, whose labor provided Europe with rum, molasses, and tobacco, completing the triangle. Newfoundland also received low quality rum back from the fish trade. This is the origin of the Newfoundland screech that uh, is such an integral part of today's tourism economy in Newfoundland. So this is another uh, deeper uh, racialized layer of colonial exploitation in my family's history. There is another layer though. None of you will be surprised to hear that the island of Newfoundland was not in fact empty at the time the Western Europeans began arriving to fish and to gradually settle. There were indigenous people here for generations, the Beothic. This map shows sites related to the Beothic. These are the little red and white X's, or their predecessors, the little passage peoples. These are the red ones. Uh, and the blue dots are burial sites uh, of the Beothic. As you can see, these were all along the coast, and they also go down into the interior of the Exploits River Valley in the central part of Newfoundland. 
A distinct Beothic culture is traced back to 1500 BC. It's believed that Vikings who arrived to the northern peninsula of Newfoundland around 1000 AD had some contact with them, and that would be up around here. At the time of John Cabot's arrival in 1497, estimates were that there were about 500 to 700 Beothic living on the island in groups of 30 to 50. And these would have been at that time mostly around the coast, although they would have gone in here for some fishing, salmon fishing. The main sources of food were, were caribou, seal, salmon, uh, bird's eggs, and um, seabirds. Um, they apparently used to eat the eggs of great ox. They would also have gathered and used the native berries and other edible plants. This type of subsidence means that they would have uh, required access to different parts of the island uh, and to the coast at different points in the year. For example, they would do a, um, they would do a caribou run where they would um, run them into a sort of a penned area or an enclosed area and, um, and spear them. Um, and they need a specific territory to do that, same as hunting seals. Um, this drawing is by a young Beothic woman named Shanna did it, um, and it shows some of the tools and implements that they would have used. And much of what we know about Beothic practice and culture comes from uh, stories that she told and pictures that she drew. So this is a caribou, this is a seal uh, spear. This one here is a caribou spear. This is a lodge for drying uh, caribou meat. However, as the coastal areas were settled by people like my family, the Beothic who relied on these areas to fish and hunt seals were forced into the interior. If you haven't been to the interior of Newfoundland, you may not realize that much of it is a thick, dense forest. Beothic traditional ways of hunting, fishing, and gathering were confined to smaller and less productive areas as settlers continued moving in to take land and resources. There is documented evidence that the Beothic sought to avoid the settlers, but despite this, many, many died from smallpox and tuberculosis, and many others were killed in acts of violence. The story of Damasduit and her husband, Nenosa Basut, is emblematic of what happened to the Beothic, but also how Newfoundlanders have learned this part of our story. In 1818, a group of Beothic took some fishing boats and gear that had been left on the shore of the Exploits River in the interior. It had been common for them to take uh, over, to take and use things that were left behind by fishermen at the time of the migratory fishery. So this was something that had been going on literally for hundreds of years. In March of 1819, the governor authorized a man named John Payton to go and find them. Damasdewitt was captured. Nanosa Basut was killed trying to protect her. They had an infant son and he also died in the raid. Damasdewitt was taken to the nearby town of Twillingate where the Anglican priest renamed her Mary March after the Virgin Mary and the month in which she was captured. Um, this drawing of her capture was actually made by Shana Didit, uh, who was her niece. The bottom part of the picture, this here, it tells two stories. The bottom part tells of a previous raid on the same community um, in 1811 by a naval captain, which ended uh, in the death of two naval officers. Um, and this is, the, um, this is the raid that took place against um, uh, Damasdewitt's community in 1819. You can see that some people were able to get away. Incidentally, it's not incidental, but I'll tell the story here. Ashana did it, who, who provided this map and the previous uh, picture and many other things. She uh, died in 1829 uh, of tuberculosis and she's considered to be the last person, she is the last person who is known definitively to have been Beothic. So this next picture is a picture of Damasduit. A trial was held into the deaths that occurred at her camp and the Newfoundlanders were found not guilty. Damasduit was taken to St. John's where she lived in Peyton's home, the man who led the raid. Uh, until she died of tuberculosis on her way home to her community in 1820. Her body was brought to her community and she was buried next to her husband. Some years later, their remains were taken by the explorer William Cormack and eventually ended up in the Royal Scottish Museum, which for years refused to repatriate them to Newfoundland 
since there were no direct Beothic descendants to receive them. Um, it will probably not surprise you to know that Peyton and Cormac are memorialized in place names throughout central Newfoundland. Damasdewit is remembered too, but not as Damasdewit. The Mary March Museum is the place where Beothic culture and history is acknowledged. But the story of Damasdewit and Ninosa Basut doesn't quite end there. Two weeks ago, two weeks ago, after years of advocacy by indigenous peoples of Newfoundland and Labrador, their remains were repatriated to the province. They are now in a vault in the Provincial Museum until an appropriate way to rebury them can be found. And that will be determined by Newfoundland's five recognized indigenous groups. The Miao Bukek uh, Mi'kmaq, the Halibut Mi'kmaq, the Innu, uh, Nunatakavut, and Nuniatsavut. So they will make that decision. It's important, it's a very important moment, and I'm very mindful of what uh, Nunatakavut President Todd Russell said during the re repatriation ceremony. He said, reflect upon this sad and tragic and horrific period in our history and how that it came to be in any day, in any age. It's unacceptable. It is a stark reminder of what colonialism can do and has done. And I would add, it rippled through history. It wasn't just an event. It ripples through till two weeks ago. Now, I grew up in Newfoundland in the 1970s, being taught that there were no indigenous peoples in Newfoundland. Despite the existence of Innu and Inuit in Labrador, and the eventual recognition of the Miaubebek in uh, Bekek, rather, in uh, the 1980s, and most recently the Halibut Mi'kmaq. I actually went to school with many members of the Halibut Nation, uh, and we all learned the same history, that they did not exist. Members of my family mem married people who are members of that nation, but we were all taught that they did not exist. I've known my family history my whole life. I learned the history of the Beothic in elementary school and the history of the Atlantic Trade Triangle in university, but somehow I never quite put these narratives together until a few years ago. Why didn't I? Maybe I didn't want to see this connection. Maybe I enjoyed the hard work story of my family as it rose to the middle class privilege that I have always enjoyed. The truth is that my family didn't just work hard in an exploitative system. It was for generations a key part of a system, colonial system, that created and was enriched by slavery and by the displacement and the extinction of an entire people. And while my ancestors were in fact exploited, they also eventually benefited, and I continue to do that. That is the privilege of whiteness, even in a system that exploits you. In tracing this history and making these connections, I hope that I have begun to decolonize my identity and my learning. Having dug into my own past, I can see my family and the forces that played out in the colonization that continues today. We live on land taken from indigenous peoples, and we continue to learn in schools, work in companies, and worship in churches enabled by that displacement. This makes us what the Métis writer Chelsea Vowell calls settler colonials. This is her book in which she raises this. People of European descent who continue to benefit from colonization. As settlers, not only do we benefit from the system set up by our forebears, we help to perpetuate them and the dispossession of others. We resist this naming quite fiercely. David Moskrop captured it perfectly in an article called What Makes Me a Canadian Settler? published in the Washington Post on February 27th. And this was in reaction to, um, this was in reaction to the, the blockades and the solidarity actions that were arising around um, the situation on Waits Awaiting territory. He says, the fundamental misunderstanding that pervades common characterizations of colonialism is that it was an historical event. Settlers who locate colonialism in the past may then wash their hands of any association with the dispossession and subjugation of indigenous peoples, then and now. That was my ancestors, they might protest. It wasn't me. They, the beneficiaries of both the past and present acts and systems of colonial violence and oppression, suggest they can't possibly be a settler. They're a Canadian. Well, in fact, you can be both, even if it makes you feel uncomfortable. And he goes on to say that settler is a relational term. To be a settler is to be bound in the social, political, 
cultural and economic structures that both make Canada possible and make it colonial. To be a settler is to exist in relation to indigenous peoples whose land was stolen and on which settlers now work, love, live, and lays about. To be a settler is to be here now. It's not just your ancestors, it's you here today. It's your benefiting from and recreating a system of recolonization, of colonialization through extraction, marginalization, abuse, and violence. Even if you face challenges paying rent, affording groceries, or finding adequate work, indeed, those struggles ought to make one all the more aware of the need for solidarity and a full accounting of relations of power. So that, friends, is kind of the task ahead of us. My childhood identity as the offspring of hardworking Newfoundlanders profoundly shapes who I am, and so does the more accurate and nuanced identity of a settler colonial. The question to me now is how it will shape me as a follower of Christ. Although it is contested terrain these days, I remain committed to reconciliation and right relationship. I continue to advocate for and follow the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as the way forward in our country and in our church. And I continue to learn my settler story, to name it and to attempt to address my privilege. This, I think, is what the scriptures call us to do when they urge us to the fast of justice and say that we shall be become the repairers of the breach, the restorers of streets to live in. I think this is what Jesus asks of us who wish to follow and be his disciples. This is another picture of Safe Harbor. This land over here on the far side of the water is Safe Harbor. And I took this picture last July. Safe Harbor has an almost mythical hold on the people who were raised there and their descendants. We always want to go back. As I said earlier, I didn't ever live there, but I visited in the summers when I was a child. And it holds a place in my heart that I find very difficult to explain. I tried to go back last summer, but the boat I had hired broke down. So we drove to Pools Island, which is this land in the foreground, uh, the closest place we could get to by road, and we looked across. That to me seems an apt metaphor. The past can be a very difficult place to reach, but it continues to ripple through the present, and we need to reckon with that. So I'd like to invite you to maybe consider exploring some of your family history and its relationship in North America's colonization, continuing colonization. I've got some questions to get you started. First thing you do is you pick one ancestral line that you can trace. Could be the one that you know the most about or the least about, or could be the one that you named your kitten after. All of these are valid choices. Look into where did your people come from? What was the land they left? What was the economy they left? Were they pushed to migrate or were they pulled? Or maybe it was both. Where did they land? Where did they settle? Sometimes those are different places. And what were the circumstances of their movement if they moved or the circumstances of them staying put where they did as my people did? Who were the indigenous people where your families settled? How were they affected by your people's migration? Is there a treaty? Does anyone respect the treaty? And where do you live now? That's still some work I need to do. How far is it from where your family originally settled? What pushed or pulled you to move? Who are the indigenous people where you live now? What are their issues and how are you involved in them? These questions can get you started and then you can just keep going. I, I, I wanna acknowledge that this talk was informed in part by uh, my participation in a continuing education event in, in February called Decolonizing Discipleship. And it was put together by the Bartimaeus Institute, which is Elaine Enns and Ched Meyer's uh, organization. And I've got a link right there, which I can also share with you. And that was a really remarkable time where people from across North America, some of whom I think are on this call, uh, came together to talk about this. So I highly recommend that. And now, comments or questions? <laughs> 